Now, we are really lucky at Ryerson. This is the premier. She's like really, really busy and important. And for six years, she's come to my MBA class every year, answers every single question, doesn't uh, say, well, don't ask that question. Your staff has been great to deal with. Uh, Noah, oh. is that what I was supposed to say, Noah? <laughs> they were great to deal <laughs> they with. They are great. They are great. They're all, do you ever hire anybody old? They're all young here. Uh, <laughs> we move and, pretty fast. Yeah. Ontario is very lucky. Uh, Premier is totally, totally dedicated. And uh, uh, we're going to have a respectful debate. I happen to be from a different political party. But uh, we, uh, uh, we respect each other. Me too. Uh, and uh, I went, I've really... I was on the election last uh, time. Do you remember? On election night, yes. I was on CTV. And about two weeks later, I saw you. What was that? Hillary Clinton big book launch lunch. You said, I saw you on CTV. You were very tough on me. Fair, but tough. And I said, one of the reasons, it was absolutely fascinating, because polling data is just ridiculous, because uh, uh, I said, one of the reasons you won, in my view, last time was likability. You have a likability quotient. Let's get right to the questions right. because they're really, really good questions. Well, let me just say thank oh. you, Ralph. Thank you for inviting me back year after year. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to come. I, I say the questions are always tougher than in question period because they're substantial. And um, I really look forward to answering them every year. So thank you very much for having okay. me, everybody. Perfect. So the first question is from Gurr. Where's Gurr? Has a question on energy policy. Oh, and I should tell you, I think I... I say to the students, uh, there's a reward, every year we do this, for the toughest, fairest, most research question. The problem is the prize is they get to have lunch with me. That's kind of <laughs> a decline the thing here. So I need your help and uh, as to a question you think is toughest, okay. fair. I may not listen, but I will at okay. least uh, ask for your, your, your advice. So where's right. Gurr? Over there. Over there, okay. Hi, Gethin. Hi. Uh, so uh, according to a report from uh, Ontario Auditor General Bernie Lissick, your government decision of 25% cut in elect residential electricity rates will have the following impacts. So the first was this could cost Ontarians an additional $4 billion in interest charges over the next 30 years. And second, the $26 billion is borrowed through Ontario power generation, so will not appear on the province's books. So electricity consumers will pay that debt through interest rates spread over the next 30 years. So she also pointed out that from 2028, uh, taxpayers will be charged more than the actual cost of the electricity being produced to pay back that borrowings. So what do you have to say about that report? Thank you for the question, Gur. So um, a couple of things about that. Um, some of you will have heard uh, my comments or the Minister of Energy's comments over the last number of uh, months, but um, I'm just going to go through the, a little bit of the background. So when, when our government came into office in 2003 under the previous premier, we had inherited a, an electricity system that needed a lot of work. And that is a nonpartisan comment, and I think I've made it in this classroom before, that um, there, had been, there had not been the investment in the electricity system that was needed. And so um, there were a lot of brownouts, a lot of blackouts happening. The, um, there was uh, a lot of coal generation. Uh, that was still in place. So we've made a lot of changes. We've upgraded the electricity system. We've built really thousands of kilometers of, uh, of uh, line and the system is now reliable and it is, um, it is clean. And so there's a cost associated with that. And the cost associated with that was in the billions of dollars. Around $50 billion we invested in the system to upgrade it. And when you think that really for 30 or 40 years there hadn't been the investment that was needed, it had not been really upgraded the way it needed to be, that was, uh, that was a reasonable investment to make. So we, uh, we did that. We've got a clean, reliable electricity grid, and there was a cost associated with that. And what people were saying to us, and it was all over the newspapers and it was all over the political discussion was that electricity prices, because of that investment, were going up too quickly and they were going up too high. And they, on top of that, the distribution charges in rural and uh, remote communities was too high. So we 
We looked at everything. We looked at everything to figure out how we could lower electricity prices. And uh, where we landed was on two strategies. One was to take social programs like the Ontario Energy Support Program, which is the low income support, and the um, uh, part of the cost of distribution charges, to take those off the rate base and put them onto the tax base, because they are more like social programs than they are um, the delivery of electricity. So we, we took those, uh, some of those costs off and put them on the, uh, the tax base. But in addition to that, um, we've taken the cost of the rebuilding of the system and we're spreading it over a longer period of time. And we worked with expert accountants to do this. We worked with um, PwC, we worked with Ernst & Young, um, we worked with Deloitte's. And we, um, with KPMG, actually I don't know who we worked with PwC, we worked with KPMG and Deloitte and uh, um, KPMG. So we are spreading the cost of that upgrade of the electricity system over a longer period of time, which means that the Auditor General is right, is that there will be a cost associated with that for my grandkids' generation, but it also means that this generation is not paying the total cost of what two previous generations didn't uh, invest in the, uh, in the system. So, so that is why we did what we did. And I will acknowledge that there is a disagreement between the Auditor General and the uh, accounting experts that we worked with. But that is, um, that is what it is. There, the accounting treatment that we used is well accepted. It's used in many, uh, it's used in many jurisdictions in the United States. And the, um, the fundamental disagreement is because our accounting, uh, our accounting rules here are silent on what we were doing. And so, because there weren't, this is the first time this has been done in Canada, but in other larger jurisdictions, it has been done before. And so we're keeping the cost of those upgrades and the cost of that borrowing in the rate base. And that's, it's called rate base accounting and that's what we're doing. How do you do with that? I mean, that's the right answer for students. You got 10 seconds in a campaign because the, well, so it's going I, I to be, don't give all that detail. You do have an answer. That, I do, that, yeah, that, I don't that, give that, that detail. Okay. I talk about the smoothing over a longer okay. period of time. Okay. I talk I, I about a mortgage, did. yeah. I knew you but did, I figured but this crowd can well, handle that, well, the longer yeah, answer, right? I didn't like it, but they, they, they liked it. They liked, they're <laughs> smart. What do I know? Jessica, son, where's Jessica? There's Jessica. Thank you. Premier. You approved refurbishment plan for multiple units in Bruce Power and, Clar and Clarington Power Plants. There are, however, different voices, such as the ir irrational fear of nuclear power plant can be dangerous to the public, or Ontario may save $11 billion to buy electricity elsewhere, and more. So the refurbishment team is under much pressure. They are told if they cannot, meet specific deadlines, the future reactor units will be canceled since the cost will make you look bad in election year. My question for you, Premier, is that when you know a policy will benefit the province but will drive your votes away in the election year, will you continue to support such policy and give up your political career as Premier? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So um, it's an interesting question because you're, you're asking about policy decisions and political um, uh, support. And I think that, I mean, I think that is a, a really interesting uh, question. On this one, I will just say to you that this is a very long-term um, endeavor. And so we're going to have election, an election long before a decision will be made on uh, whether to continue on a contract like that. What we did with the contracts was we built in the possibility that if conditions changed, as you said, if there were other sources of energy or there were other decisions that we could make where we could get cheaper energy that would um, satisfy the supply or if things like storage, which is just being, there's innovation that's happening right now in the storage sector. Um, if circumstances change or the cost overruns are such that it's, uh, it's untenable, then we built what we've called off ramps into the contract so that if there, um, if there is a, a target that hasn't been met or circumstances have changed, then we can exit the contract without it costing um, billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars to actually 
close that contract. So it's actually a prudent way to build a contract when there's a project of this magnitude, which is billions of dollars, um, to actually provide for that contingency that there might be a change. Okay. Steve Taylor. How are you doing, Kathleen? Great. I am all for greenhouse gas reductions and an avid climate change crusader. However, I am genuinely, genuinely concerned about the economic impact that may result from the Government of Ontario's action plan. The report on climate change by the Ministry of Education and Climate Change indicates that the government's cap and trade initiative will not lead to a substantial reduction in electricity prices as the action plan outlines. Instead, according to the Office of the Auditor General, businesses and households will face a 13% and 23% increase respectively. My question is two part. Compounded by recent increases in interest rates and burgeoning household debt in Ontario, how do you expect lower and middle income families to cope with this added cost? Secondary question is how will you convince businesses to continue to operate and or invest in Ontario given that the cost of doing so is increasing? Good question. Thanks for the question, Steve. That's a Thank good you. question. So um, we're in, a, we're in a, um, an environment right now that uh, requires all of us, in my opinion and in the opinion of um, millions of citizens of this country and, um, and other jurisdictions, uh, we're in an environment where we all have to do our bit to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have, in Ontario, we have made the single largest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the, on the continent by shutting down all the coal-fired plants. Um, and, and so now we're taking the next steps. And what the cap and trade system will do is actually allow, um, allow businesses and, um, and residents to benefit from the revenue that comes in. So we set a cap on, uh, on the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and then you lower that cap. We're, so we met our targets. Um, 6 percent uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions vis-a-vis -vis 1990 emissions uh, by 2014 and then we have uh, a 15 percent target uh, reduction on 1990 uh, emissions by 2020 and we're on target to uh, to meet that so so there actually are targets that we are that we are hitting and the the um, climate action plan is not about reducing electricity prices in fact our electricity grid because of the conversation we had earlier, the information in that conversation, we already have a 90 to 95% clean electricity grid. So um, it's, a, it's a very emissions-free electricity grid because we shut down the coal-fired plants. There is some gas, um, natural gas, that, uh, that causes uh, some uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But other than that, it's pretty clean. So uh, the cap and trade uh, system is about a market that will allow us to uh, allow businesses particularly to trade allowances so that overall there will be a reduction. And our market right now, as you know, is Quebec, California, and Ontario. We're hoping, for example, that New York may come in. We're hoping Manitoba may come in. So, so there are other jurisdictions that are looking at joining that market. And so businesses can buy allowances, and as they reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, then they'll have to buy fewer um, fewer allowances as they develop innovation that allows them to reduce uh, GHGs, then they will have fewer um, allowances that they'll have to buy. But the money from those allowances, the revenue from those allowances gets put back into the economy. So every dollar that comes in from uh, cap and trade goes back into, for example, um, right now um, people in the province are able to buy smart, um, smart thermometers for their, uh, their homes, smart controls for their homes. I think 150,000 have gone out already. And um, with that, you get a, uh, an audit of your home and installation. And that's cap and trade dollars. Those are cap and trade dollars that are allowing that kind of thing to happen. And so people can, people can actually find ways to save on their heating costs, save on their electricity costs. And so that's the way the, the system works. Um, if we were to put a, uh, a carbon tax in place, it would be double or triple the amount that it would cost per, uh, per household. So we looked for the cheapest, most effective way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions because that was the objective. Okay? Thanks for the question. Uh, Alex. Where's Alex? You moved. You were over here before last class. 
Oh, you could get the guy in the camera. Hey, we're in <laughs> Alex's way here. That's not nice here. So Toronto is one of the most congested cities in North America. That's very obvious even if you just walk out in uh, Dundas Square. Uh, it's actually been ranked as the eighth most congested city in North America and is amongst the top 100 in the world, which is pretty significant. Uh, Toronto's con congestion actually continues to grow at about a 5% uh, per year growth. As the cost of li living in Toronto rises, more and more people are moving to the suburbs, like the 905, to commute to their jobs here in Toronto. Toronto's infrastructure is too antiquated to handle all this uh, increased cars coming into the city, with the DVP and the Gardner very much being the only true arteries into the downtown core. Within the city itself, roads are becoming congested, and really there's less than ideal public transportation options as well. Mayor John Tory came up with a unique solution at the beginning of this year to charge a $2 toll uh, on the DVP and the Gardner to fund transit expansion within the city itself. Uh, this toll would have primarily been charged on commuters coming into the city from the 905, 705, uh, all the areas around, bringing an estimated $300 million a year into the city, which would be directly put back into transit expansion. Other cities around the world, like London, do charge congestion taxes, and this has been a very successful model. Your government chose to kill this plan as it was deemed unaffordable to Ontario families and because there are currently no other feasible options for commuters to get into the city. So, what is your government proposing to fix congestion in the city, and why has this issue not been addressed in the previous 14 years of your party being in power in the province? Well, let me just say that we are making the biggest infrastructure investment in the province's history, and a large part of that is being invested in Toronto and the GTA to build transit, to build exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, when I was a kid, now Ralph will remember this, he's probably younger than I am, but... Um, substantially in, older. In 19... Uh, substantially older. <laughs> so I was born in 1953, and in 1955, 57, 58, 59, um, I would go on the subway with my grandmother, and I can remember I would wear my white gloves because she wanted me to keep my hands clean, but the subway was a really exciting thing. I think it was completed in 1947, um, so it was a big deal. We did not keep building, right? We built that subway and we were all very proud of it, but we didn't keep building. And so, um, so we're playing catch up. And that is exactly why we're confronting the situation that you are, but that you're talking about. But very soon you will see the, um, the extension of the Spadina subway line open that goes into uh, York Region. It's the first it's the first subway line to cross uh, uh, a municipal boundary. Um, it will open soon. The Eglinton Crosstown line is being built. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested in municipal transit. And, um, and so, so we, are, we are working to, to address that issue. One of the biggest things that we're doing is investing in regional express rail. So um, expanding the GO train system because although you are right about, you're probably two thirds right in terms of the, uh, the commuter traffic, but there's at least a third of the traffic that's not coming into Toronto, it's going out of Toronto to work in, uh, in the suburbs. And so, um, so we're seeing that flow back and forth. And so we've had, up until now, we've had GO trains, you know, coming in the morning into Toronto and going out at night. They need to be going both ways uh, all day. And so we're uh, in the process of getting the rail in place and working with CN to make sure that we have rail that we can run full day two-way GO service. So those, those changes are, uh, they mean billions of dollars of investment. So on the tolling issue, one of the other things that we have done is we've put HOV lanes in place and we are, um, we've got a pilot project of HOT lanes, so high occupancy toll lanes. So actually tolling was something that we believe in, it is something that we are doing. When John Tory, who is a friend, we, you know, we work very well together, um, when he raised the issue of tolls, um, he did not have a regional discussion about it. So we had an abstract conversation about tolls, and then he brought forward a proposal that would mean that there was no consultation with the, uh, the 905. And um, just as you said, because there is not yet a good option for people. There isn't a good transit option yet. We don't have full day two-way go on those arteries. Um, it was not feasible to do. So we're increasing the gas tax share. So we're not increasing the gas tax. We're sharing more of the gas tax with municipalities. The City of Toronto will have 
more actually, more quickly. They'll have the money that they would have brought in through the tolls, so they will be made whole on that, uh, on that proposal. But I will just end by saying one of the challenges in this region is that we have got to have more regional solutions. So on transit, just as a, uh, if we stay on that example, we've got to have integrated fares, for example. So we just announced that you can get a break on your TTC fare if you're coming into the city and you've ridden the GO train. Those kinds of solutions need to be in place because people don't, they don't think about the boundary between Durham and the City of Toronto or York Region and the City of Toronto. Those, those boundaries don't mean very much to a commuter and so we have to have more regional solutions and so when I said to John that we weren't going to do the tolls, I said to him part of the problem is there had not been a regional discussion. Have you had the regional discussion now? We, you know, we are having the fair integration discussion at, because I call together the GTHA mayors on a regular basis every four to six weeks, and there's a working group working on fair integration. But they're right never, now. the 905s are never going to say that's terrific. I mean, I think it's, the, in my view, wrong decision, but Patrick Brown whipped out, I phoned him too. Dumb. It's political. They're never, those 905 are never going to agree. Well, actually, the 905, 905, 705, 519, those municipalities are saying to us, we want, we want revenue tools. Now, you're right, we can't pin them down on exactly what revenue tools yeah. they want. But I think if there were going to be tolls on the Don Valley and the, uh, and the Gardner, there would have to be some agreement among the, the regional mayors at the re regional councils. There would have okay. at least have to have been a discussion about it. But are they discussing? You, you said you told Tory no because there's no discussion. That was a year ago. Yeah, but Has there's no it? proposal. There's no proposal that's come forward. We, we are increasing the gas tax because we get that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. But until there's a, a discussion at the, at the regional level, we can't, we can't ask okay. people to, uh, to pay that. Okay. And, and furthermore, there was, a, there was a discussion at the time that the toll proposal came forward that only people from the 905, only people from outside would pay. And that, that was really discriminatory, and that I was a, that. a real challenge. Well, okay. I, hope, I hope they discuss it, and I am a big supporter of uh, tolls and with a proper utilization of the money, that you put it into a place and not put it in your general revenues. I don't trust yeah, yeah. you or any government. To... <laughs> well, <laughs> you, know, you know, the congestion tax that Alec talked about, I mean, if you look at the, you look at the transit lines, you look mm -hmm. at the train right. service in, right. in England, that's way, way different. So people can, you can hop on a train, I would argue, more easily. Just like in the Netherlands. I lived in the Netherlands for three years. It's easier to take a train or a tram from The Hague, where I lived, to Amsterdam than it is to drive your car. So that's where we have to get to, but we're, we're not there yet. Okay. Jason, where's Jason right Belsey? There. There's Jason. Thank you, Madam Premier. <clears throat> um, I'm a resident of Vancouver. Uh, at NBC, we don't have the extreme oil wealth of Alberta or Saskatchewan, nor the head offices of Toronto to support high-income jobs. And as a result, our provincial per capita income is lower than the national average. However, BC has been a net contributor towards intra-provincial equalization payments over the last nine years, while Ontario has simultaneously been a net recipient. Uh, while I respect that Ontario draws a fraction of what Quebec does from the equalization system, how do you reconcile the fact that Canada's economic engine and a province with a higher per capita GDP and higher per capita income than BC is a net recipient of intra-provincial transfer payments? And further, how do you justify Ontario being a net recipient of equalization over the past nine years when Newfoundland, with an unemployment rate of nearly 15% and significantly lower per capita income, is also a net contributor. Given that the spirit of equalization is for wealthy provinces to help prop up those that are less wealthy, is the formula we use to determine equalization levels broken? So, um, Jason, I'm not sure where you got your numbers because Ontario's always been a net contributor. Before the economic downturn, we were a net contributor to the tune of, I think, about 11 billion. Now we're a net contributor of uh, about 5.7 or 8 billion. Um, and we're the top net contributor. I think Alberta's second, I think BC, and then, and then it goes down from there. So I think maybe where, maybe where this has gotten mixed up is that we, we are receiving, we have received equalization payments, but just because you receive equalization, what that means is we're getting some of our own money back in Ontario, but we still are putting more into equalization 
then we get back. And, and this year it's about uh, five and a half to five point eight billion. So, so we, you know, we see ourselves in Ontario as, um, as you said, the economic engine. We are leading the growth in the country. Um, BC and Ontario, in terms of growth, are uh, are kind of neck and neck. Um, our unemployment rate is uh, lower than it's been in, I think, sixteen years. So, so we are actually doing very well, and we continue to be a net contributor and our equalization payments because our economic growth is up is that our equalization payments that the amount we're getting back is actually going down so we our net contribution will continue to rise somebody do some research because i thought you were right i thought that uh, i'd read it somewhere that we were always the engine and we threw money and now we're taking it out no you're saying no i mean we are no i think and this is the this is the misunderstanding ralph we are getting some Back. But I'm talking about net. You're saying but no, net. Net, net, net. We're over five and a half. Okay, someone do some research because uh, I hope you and I are right here. <laughs> we can come back to you because I. <laughs> okay. But, I, but my, I think my information might have come from the Toronto Star or something like that. Something more likely the Sun though on that one. <laughs> more likely the Sun. More yeah. likely the Sun. <laughs> uh, Martha. Martha's got a good question. It's right there. It on? Yes. Okay. Um, so last Monday, over 12,000 Ontario college faculty and instructors went on strike, which resulted in classes being cancelled at 24 publicly funded Ontario colleges, affecting 500,000 students. Last Thursday, student leaders from the colleges penned an open letter to you and other members of the Ontario legislature asking for you to get the union and the colleges back to the bargaining table so they can resume their studies, something which hasn't been going on for the past little right. while. A spokesperson for the Ontario government stated that the government is not planning to legislate any back-to-work action or participate in this debate. With over 40% of funding for colleges coming from the government, what reason do you and your government have for choosing to be an observer over an active participant in the strike when your investment is now not serving its purpose of getting education for students? Well, this is something I'm very concerned about. Um, and in fact, we do have mediators who are involved, so we are actively involved. In fact, today, the minister um, met with <coughs> representatives of the college administration, the council, and she met with student groups yesterday. Um, we, are, we are very much calling on the, uh, the parties to get back to the table. I believe in the collective bargaining process. I think that it is a, uh, it's a, a good process. It has served us well in this province and um, relative to other jurisdictions, we have not had enormous amounts of labor disruption. I mean, there's some exceptions to that, obviously. Um, and in terms of the mechanisms, short of legislating back, we can't demand that the parties go to the table. We can encourage. We can certainly uh, express a very strong expectation that that will happen, um, but uh, and that is what the minister and I have been doing. Um, we're watching it very closely, but uh, as I said, the best the best agreements are going to be at the table because when there is an agreement at the table, then there's buy-in from both sides of the uh, of the negotiation, and that makes for a, a better environment going forward. When I say I'm watching it closely, I don't want anybody to mm. lose their term. You know, yeah. I mean, these are. Somebody said to me today, you know, that uh, they're getting calls from their office, and there are young people who who need to get job applications in. This is their last term, and they are uh, they're about to go into the workforce. So, we really do not want them to lose those opportunities. At the same time, all the other things I said pertain. Well, yeah, I forgot. You went to Queens, didn't you? Remember, I told yeah. you I do not like Queens. You know, you know why I don't like Queens? Does anyone know? Because I went to Western. You see, <laughs> if you're my age, you, you went to one of the four universities. And we have great universities, but you uh, either went to Western or, uh, or Queens. And if you went to Western, you didn't like people from Queens. And yeah, people, and I went to Queens because you didn't I like didn't want to go to Western. Because you didn't know how to party. <laughs> <laughs> we, we I didn't know how to party. party. <laughs> I used to go down to Western and party with my friends. Well, but. I'm sure. I mean, that's a terrific. Uh, it was a good school in spite of being a party school. And I, I had some good times there. Allison, where's Al Allison? Are you still at the back? Oh, yeah, you're at the back. Meanwhile, the Ryerson students were all just working hard. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Last week, they had a case competition. No sleep. No sleep, I heard. Hello. Um, I just had a quick question um, about the minimum wage um, in Ontario. So the timeline for increasing the minimum wage in Ontario under the 
Fair Workplaces and Better Jobs Act has been criticized by some advocates for small businesses for being too rapid, as it proposed an increase of almost 25% only seven months from its announcement. Uh, a few months before the plan was announced, you were quoted defending the existing system of nudging it upward once a year by the rate of inflation, saying that it depoliticizes the increases to the minimum wage. Can you explain why the timeline was designed to move so quickly and how small businesses um, in Ontario, especially ones outside of big cities like Toronto and Ottawa, are expected to cope? Thanks. Sure. And uh, it's actually, you know, I've actually heard from small businesses in large and small uh, jurisdictions. So um, I, I, I understand that there are some businesses, particularly in certain sectors, that are going to have challenges. Um, let me just say that. The, um, the concept of the minimum wage being tied to inflation still is, uh, is, going, to, is going to be in place in Ontario once, once the minimum wage uh, increase is finalized January 2019, then f they will, we will go back to that system of the uh, increases being tied to inflation. When we, when we first pegged the increase to, um, to inflation, the, um, the economy was not doing as well. Um, and at the time, we didn't feel that we could take the leap because we were in a situation where the minimum wage between 1996 or 1995, 96 and 2003 had been frozen. So for eight or nine years, there had been no increases to the minimum wage. So we fell behind in terms of uh, cost of living increases. And so when we came into office, we started to increase it. Um, but we didn't do that jump. We didn't do that catch up because the economy was not doing as well as, uh, as it is now. And so we made a decision that uh, at this point, this was the time because the economy is doing well, but the, the gap between people who are doing well and people who are not is growing. And so this is about helping those people who really have been flatlined in minimum wage jobs um, for you know, over a decade. Um, and this is not this is not just an Ontario problem. This is a this is a Western world challenge. And so, if we're going to deal with um, uh, poverty and inequity in any real way, then we have to find we have to find ways to close that gap. So this is one of them. Um, we uh, we are working with small businesses. You know, the reality is that we've got people living in this province who are working on minimum wage. They may even be working two jobs and they are going to the food bank. They can't look after themselves, they can't look after their families. It's unacceptable in a province as wealthy as ours, and so um, we, you know, we didn't do it in one step, we're doing it in two steps, um, this January and next January. And as I said, we are working with small business, and in the fall economic statement, um, you will see the, uh, the minister will bring forward some, will bring forward some supports for small business across the board, but also for particular sectors. Agriculture, I'm concerned about, um, you know, the, particularly the horticulture sector, um, where there are a lot of seasonal workers and um, there's a lot of reliance on that, that kind of temporary workforce. Um, there are some challenges, other challenges in our workplace changes that we're going to be dealing with, but we're very cognizant of that. But the bottom line is, um, you know, New York's going to $15 an hour. Um, San Francisco's going to $15 an hour. Alberta's going to $15 an hour. Indiana. They're all, they're all socialist governments. Indiana. Indi give me Indiana. Indiana. <laughs> Not a socialist Not a government, government by a long yeah, shot. I agree with that. Has, uh, they're going to has got wage? a resolution there. They're raising their minimum wage too. So, you know, we're playing catch up actually on this. So how do you deal with it? I mean, because I don't support it. Because I think what's going to happen is the entrepreneurs are going to have less people working there. And uh, I don't know the answer because I agree with you. You shouldn't be, you know, making ten bucks an hour. That's absurd because uh, you can't live on it. But you're going to go to zero. How, how are you going to deal with, uh, well, with, with the, that? Well, the evidence is that actually jobs increase, and and that's. I mean, so there's that piece when we look at when we look at what has happened. I've when read, it, I've read literature that jobs don't increase. So well, there there are dueling you, economists on this. We've got 53 yeah. economists who say that that it will right. it will work. But here's the thing. Um, I recognize that there is a risk for some yeah. sectors. That's why we're going to bring forward some supports. Okay, so we're going to watch for. It's not going to mitigate it completely. So I don't no. want anybody to say, Kathleen, you said it was going to be a one-to-one -one relief. It's not going to be. But the other reality, the other reality, Ralph, is that I go to small communities. I mean, I was in Woodstock um, a few weeks ago, and you know, there's a there's a small chocolate 
um, factory on on the main street, and it's got a retail and a and a wholesale component, and they're already paying. $15 an hour. So the fact is that there are small businesses, there are medium-sized businesses, and there are large businesses that are already there, and this isn't going to affect them at all. Okay, we're going to watch. Now, <laughs> women, women in leadership uh, is a big issue, and I've got a particular question, but I'm going to have Victoria ask your question, and then I'm going to do my follow-up on the issue that you know I'm passionate about. Oh, I think it's a question about boards coming. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I got numbers, and I'm going to... We actually had uh, Tanya Van Beeson, who runs Catalyst. Catalyst, yeah. For the, who, who is terrific. With, She's a yeah. really, really smart lady. Uh, I liked her. Yeah. And Vic, uh, Victoria. Victoria is president of Willa, yeah. Women in Leadership, Leadership uh, Association. Association. Okay. Okay. okay, so um, to kind of some context, of course, you know, everybody asks you really hard questions and you have your campaign version of answering these questions and then you have your group of educated people version. And, you know, even just hearing you say these things provides a different perspective than you would get, you know, reading articles and watching the news. And so my question goes back to in August, um, you did an interview with Christina Tenalia at CP24 about your personal rating compared to the overall liberal rating and that in context of everything else that's going, everyone else as well as everything else that's going on in Canada. And you said, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't need to be a good friend, I don't need to be your friend, I need to be a good premier and I need to be a politician. So how do you respond and continue to respond when you're being put in a position of blame and controversy and constant backlash from the community? And at what point for you does politics end and Kathleen Wynne begins? And the second part to that question is how do you directly translate this into advice or direction to other women in business or politics who are faced with personal attacks as a result of professional or political decisions? Well, it's a great question, and I've just started reading Hillary Clinton's book. Um, would you recommend it? Yeah, I would. I wasn't sure. I, I thought, you know, she's written it really soon after the election, and I thought it was too soon, but it's very readable, mm -hmm. and you might be interested particularly on the, the chapter on women in politics, because it is, uh, it's very interesting. Um, and I think there's a whole conversation there about what happens when women get into roles where traditionally there have been men and how that starts to irritate people over time, right? I just want, I just want somebody familiar. I want that tall, rich, white guy that I've been used to for 150 years. I want that guy in, the, uh, in that job. I don't want her anymore because she reminds me, I don't know, of my mother or a sister or an aunt who I don't like and she's nagging me and she's old. You know, like I think there's something about that that goes on. Um, and she talks about, she talks about that in her, uh, in her book. Um, and I think it's just a matter of there being more of us. You know, I think the more of us there are in roles of authority where traditionally men have, uh, have been, then the better off we'll be and the more used to us people will, uh, people will get. But your question is more about how do you get people there because as I, if I'm interpreting it, if people look at, look at me or look at Hillary Clinton and look at our social media feeds and look at the comments, why on earth would you jump in? Why would you do that, right? So I think the answer is that you, each one of us has our own personal coping mechanisms, you know, and in that, in that response, um, I'd been asked over and over and over again about my popularity. And, um, you know, I wanted, at some point I just wanted to laugh and say, look, I'm really glad you're asking me this. I love that my numbers are so low. Please ask me again. You know, it's like, how do you feel about this? Well, how do you think I feel about it? You know, I, I hate it, but so what? It's, you know, at some point it's irrelevant because I didn't get into the job to be popular. That, that wasn't the point. I got into this job I ran for office in the first place because I believe in publicly funded education. I mean, that's at the core of why I'm in politics because I think it is, I think it is the most important thing we do. It's not the most expensive thing we do, that's healthcare. But education is the most important thing we do because if we get that right, then everything else 
we can get right. So, so that's why I'm in politics. And if I, can, if I can work with the team to make good policy decisions, and you know what's interesting is that the polls also show that people like what we're doing. They just somehow don't like me. Well, okay, fine. You know, fine. Yeah, you don't like me? Okay. You don't have to. You don't have to be my family. And that's kind of what I said to the reporter. I've got my family. My family loves me. And the, the rest of it is we have, a, we have a working relationship. We have a social contract that I will do what I was elected to do. And I have done what I was elected to do. I do do what I said I was going to do, you know? And I think that is, that's got to be at the end of the day, that's got to be the measure of a politician. And so that's why I, I try not to laugh at the reporters when they ask me one more time about the, about the polling numbers. Um, but I'm going to continue to do my work. The final thing I will say is that when you go into politics or when you take on a leadership role, People will sometimes say, you know, you have to develop a thick skin. And I would just counsel any of you who are thinking about that. You have to develop a porous thick skin. Because if you develop a skin that is, you know, naugahyde and nothing can get through, then you're not going to hear the pain of people. You're not going to hear the concerns. And so you have to continue to be responsive and deal with that pain and that concern that you're going to have to absorb. So I run, you know, I, I try to look after myself physically, that helps me. I try to see my grandkids as often as I can, see my kids. Those are things that ground me. Even going to, you know, spend time with my um, failing parents who are 89 and 91, you know, um, that grounds me too being around people who I care about. So we all have our coping mechanisms. Some people play bridge, some people um, knit, you know, some people... Um, you haven't hit me yet, I don't bridge, I don't play bridge. Ride I, motorcycles. I no, so no, I, I've, got, no. I've got caucus members who ride their motorbikes, you know. They, so everybody has a way of coping, um, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to look after yourself and let in what people are saying to you at the same time. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I'm passionate about democracy. I want to make sure that you take a look at the next election. And next year we have two elections. We have the city uh, and we've got the provincial election. So I want you to pay attention and vote. Get involved if you can. I don't care who you vote for. I do care who you vote for, but I won't tell you who to <laughs> vote for. I'm partisan, but uh, follow the issues. Is anybody involved politically? You are. With the Conservatives, I hope. But here's but, uh, the thing. Here's the thing. But okay. here's the thing, Ralph. Okay. Every person in this room is involved politically. Because they have... Because uh, you're living in a place where there's a power dynamic, where decisions are being made. And if you vote, you're involved politically. If you don't vote, you're involved politically because you're letting somebody else vote for you. I always say, you know, when I'm knocking on doors and a young man of color comes to the door and says to me, I don't vote, it's got nothing to do with me. I say, you know what? Then... Somebody who looks like me is voting in your stead because that's the reality. An older white person is much more likely to vote than a young person. So, you know, we're all involved politically, some of us passively and some of us actively. And it, Ralph will tell you that it has to be partisan involvement. I will say to you, being involved in issues, you know, Victoria, you're involved in politics because you're challenging a power dynamic. That's what politics is. Good. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not, I was good, that's okay. <laughs> you know, she likes to come here because she debates me and she wins, because she's smarter than me and she's actually read stuff here, so I think that's why you love showing up here. No, what, my, the issue that when you came six years ago, uh, I became conscious through corporate social responsibility, which I didn't know when I showed up here, that yeah. you wrote a check, about the abysmal numbers of women on public company boards, like really bad, and after last year, the two uh, two of the public boards I was on, I put a woman. I put Kirsten Stewart, president of Twitter, on SCORE, and a great board member. And I put a woman on uh, uh, smart engineer uh, scientist on Electrovia. Mm -hmm. But if you take a look and you read the Catalyst literature, it shows boards mm -hmm. do way, way better. Companies, the, the companies do better. Companies do better. But yeah. the numbers, yeah. you have something called Comply or Explain. The problem that I have with Comply or Explain is there's no ramifications. Mm -hmm. You say, I got eight guys on the board. Uh, you know, we looked for some, we couldn't find somebody. You, you got to, at some point in time, because the numbers went from 12 to 14, so they're going up yeah, one, one a year. If you say you want to get to 30, 
I think you're going to have to say there's a penalty. We talked with Raj. Uh, law firms are g getting there. We're, you know, mm -hmm. the students we hire are 50 percent. Price Water is 50 percent. And government's getting there. And we, got, we on we your board. Set, yeah, yeah we've got. It? We've actually set a target of 40 yeah. percent on our boards okay. and agencies and commissions, um, and we're at 44 percent, but not every single board. So that's but, across but, across government. But I'm interested that the non-interventionist government guy is saying that we should put a penalty for private business. It's interesting. Well, I wrote, I wrote an op-ed piece that yeah, I, I think I, I sent it to yeah, you, you did. where I, I said I'm a, a, a less government guy. I'm bothered by it, I but I think I, and I, when I write the article, I said, oh my God, I got to have a conclusion. So my conclusion was set a time limit. Of, if it keeps yeah. being 1%, then uh, you could come. If you said to us at the score, uh, you know, unless you get to uh, uh, a third female, there's going to be a $100,000 penalty. It's going to be 100%. We're going to do it. You could go Norway example and say you'll take away our charter, but it seems to me at some point, yes. now I have most opposition from my women friends who say, oh, no, that's quotas, don't do that, but you're not going to get there, I don't think. Well, and we've been having this conversation with Catalyst, and I've done a couple of panels mm -hmm. on this, and I, I was asked about quotas versus targets. I'm more of a fan of targets than mm -hmm. I am of quotas. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, we, you know, we, we started with Comply and yeah. Explain. We've, got some, we've set some targets now. Yeah. But you're right, Ralph. If we don't see movement over the next three or four years, I, I think we, you know, we will have to look at more draconian interventionist measures. If I could get Patrick Brown and Andrea and you to sign a joint something. Would you do that? Saying it's really bad. <laughs> I mean, I just thought of it right now. I mean, I'm probably the only person I could go. I, 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 like, I quite like Andrea. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I disagree with her well, way we, more than I disagree with you, but might, she, she's a nice we might lady. Have to look at, we might have to look at the details of your charter or whatever who, you're going to have who, assigned. Who, who can I talk to about it? Because I'd like to have the three you parties You can talk say, to my chief of staff. Who's that? Andrew Bevan. Okay. okay. Will, you, will you tell him I'm, I don't I know will. him? He wouldn't know who I am here. Was Matt, he here? Yeah, no, no, he, no, no. He's not Maddie, here. Maddie and oh, Maddie. Maddie okay. will make so sure that make, Andrew make sure knows Because I, I want to, I'll come up and meet with him. Okay. And see if, because I could, I, I think I'm the one person that might be able to get a joint statement that, that we're looking at it. Get help with Catalyst. He, okay? um, he knows who you are. So oh, he does. Okay. okay. <laughs> You're <laughs> that, very that's, infamous. That's not good. <laughs> I'm really not a bad person. Uh... <laughs> You shouldn't laugh when I say that. You should say, where's Kumar? You're not a bad Thank person. you. Kumar. Over there. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. My question to you reads as, in the corporate world, various initiatives are taken to increase LGBT diversity in the workplace and to create a supportive environment for them. However, in my understanding, such initiatives must not be a norm in the political sphere. I was wondering, how did you manage to emerge as the champion of such noble cause in political surrounding? You must have faced challenges, and how did you deal with them? Was acceptance a problem at the initial stage of your political career? Rational of asking this question is to understand the basic mindset of our own politicians who are responsible for making policies and enacting laws related to all aspects, including pertinent to LGBT welfare. Thank you. Um, that's a great question, and it's a bit related to the, the, the previous question. Um, so the challenges that, that I might have faced early on um, when I was getting into, into politics had to do with being a woman but being a lesbian, um, I think, even more. I mean, when I, when I decided that I was going to run to be a school trustee, um, and then I was going to run to be an MPP later. I made that decision. In both those situations, there was homophobic literature that was spread about me. And there, you know, there were people in the party when I decided to run for the Liberals in 2003 who said, you know what, you can't win in this neighborhood. You're going to have to move somewhere else. And we're not sure you can. And when I ran to be the leader of the party, there were people who said, you can't, you can't win an election in Ontario. So there were, there were always those naysayers um, because of who I was. And um, what was important to me was that I knew why I was getting into politics. You know, I knew that it wasn't, I knew that it wasn't going to be glamorous. I knew that it was going to be a lot of hard work, but I believed in what I was doing. And I had a strong team of people around me who believed in me. And they were, they were the, they were the people who 
I relied on to, uh, to carry on. And that's very, very important. Politics is a team sport. You cannot, you cannot do this by yourself. And Ralph's been an amazing support to so many politicians in his, uh, in his career. And having people like Ralph who are loyal and who are, who are hardworking, um, that's, that's what keeps you going as a politician. And I think the, I think the final thing is that you, you have to be at a point in your life where you are, as I said, you know why you're in it. You know, you're, because if you're in it for the fame and the glory, you're going to get very tired very soon because it is, that's not what it's about. It's a lot of hard work. And of course, there are wonderful, rewarding moments, but there's a, a lot of work and a lot of negativity that you have to deal with. And so you need that support team around you. It was interesting. We had this discussion uh, in November. You would, uh, McGinty had just stepped down. Mm. You were going to be the first openly lesbian candidate. And I had just finished chairing Smitherman's campaign for mayor, mm -hmm. where I wasn't sure whether, uh, uh, and I'd said to you, with Smitherman, I thought it was going to be a wash. I thought that uh, there would be some you know, backlash or people were quiet. But there'd be a lot of people like me saying, you know what, it's the right candidate and, and yeah. whatever. The issue that I found, and I said to my students at the time, their parents. They may be very, you may be very open. Some of you ask your parents. They may not be as open, but what I was really happy, I wasn't happy when you won the election, but I was happy that Ontario didn't look at the issue. Yes. It was, yes. you got voted in, unfortunately, but it was an issue based, <laughs> and I was proud as to be- He says it gently, so he thinks <laughs> that makes no, it and nice. I was, I was proud, because I didn't think rural Ontario, my mind said, oh, rural Ontario is gonna have difficulty. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. You won uh, seats there, exactly. so that was good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Ontario is a place that, at its heart, is progressive mm -hmm. and wants to take people as they come. Um, one of the things I worry about what's going on in the United States right now is that there are divisions being opened up that have been healed over years, and, um, and they're really being stirred up by, uh, by the president, and I think that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah, I would agree. I'm yeah. deeply disturbed in the United yeah. States, and more, what's, what I'm most deeply is I have friends who I can't talk politics to because they support right. Trump, and they're, they're and it's it's breaking up marriages. You watch, oh, and it's yeah. it's the men side of it. These are smart clients of mine, rich guys who I thought were smart. I can't talk politics because he's a he's a buffoon. I mean, he's a. I just I, I just I won't read Hillary Clinton's book. I hate her. But I, 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 I hate him more. I mean, I think uh, uh, she's the reason we got Donald Trump. Anybody else would have beaten them, so I blame her. Uh, of course but, you do. So, <laughs> so I won't be reading her book. But uh, Victoria, you will it tell me. It might actually be edifying. What's that? It might be edifying for you to read Hillary's book. OK. I, I, I will take that. I'll buy it for you. I, I will think about it. I, I'll buy it and sign it for you. OK. Oh, OK. Manuel? Where's Manuel? Good. Yeah, well, about uh, Avista. Avista. Energy, okay. Well, first, uh, let me tell you something. I come from Colombia, and there, when it's talking about popularity, when a politician has that level of popularity, they say they're going to be removed because of ineptitude or uh, corruption. I'm surprised that uh, I was looking to what are the reasons uh, for, for yours, and, and, and I find that you're doing the right thing. So if that's the punishment, then go ahead. <laughs> Take so it. be it. <laughs> so be it. Well, so uh, in that research, I, I found that w uh, one of the controversial moves of your administration has been the purchase of the energy company Avista, which owns a coal operation in Montana. And of course, you have got backlash because of that fact that it's uh, seemingly mm -hmm. um, contradictory with your general policy. And I, I noticed that you, in a, the, uh, previously you, you said that you hope that this purchase will help sharing Ontario's coal-free value system, uh, well, with, with the US in this case, but in the Trump era with the coal lobbyists as powerful as they are, and uh, you know the U.S. potentially withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. What exactly is your plan to reduce carbon emissions or to um, share these values to America? Is is it 
Is Avista going to close that coal plant in in Kalstrup, I think is the town, the town name? So um, we don't have control, direct control over that. And in fact, the the genesis of this um, purchase is that we we actually changed the ownership structure of Hydro One. So um, we uh, we have um, broadened the ownership of Hydro One. No single entity can own more than 10%, but um, it is now a privately run company, not, no longer a, a government run company. So um, there's still over 40% ownership by, uh, by the people of Ontario, but it's a, minor, it's a minority share. So that was the first controversial decision, but I did that because we needed to generate some funds to build that transit infrastructure that I talked about earlier and roads and bridges and so on. And so that was a hard decision for me because it was actually more a decision that philosophically would have rested with somebody like Ralph, but I was making a decision that uh, ran against my, um, you know, some of the pool of voters who supported me, but I'm a very practical person. I'm a liberal, and uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we did. And so they are now privately run, so they made a business decision to acquire this company, which will make them stronger uh, as a company, which is a good thing. Um, and it's a, I think it's a 10% ownership in a coal plant. I don't think, it, or 10%, it's, the coal plant is 10% of their portfolio. I believe that's how it, uh, how it goes. So, um, and the, the reality is that there aren't, there aren't many places where you could find a company, an energy company, that is as clean as what we've got in, uh, in Ontario. So if this, if this company is going to grow, it's going to be hard pressed to, uh, to have no um, uh, GHG uh, emissions. So, so I understand why they made the decision. We don't have direct control. And in my comments um, were that, you know, I think that a company like Avista, what I've been told is that they, they know the value system of Ontario. They were actually looking for a, pre a uh, progressive jurisdiction because they are moving in that direction. So my hope is that at some point we will have that influence. But you're right, things have changed in the United States on that front as well, and so it may take longer. I was surprised there wasn't a question, and I don't know how you do your research, because I'm not smart enough to Google and things like that, on governments involved in, in two trials, uh, not you personally, but uh, there was a trial up in Sudbury uh, uh, where your people got off, uh, but there's a, a huge... Well, they were, there was a complete acquittal. The Conservatives asked a question today and they commingled the two things. So, okay. so Vic Fideli said, you know, the Premier, and he didn't make it clear that it was the previous Premier. And here's why it's important. Because when this was happening, the period of time that this trial is about is when we were in transition. I was not in the Premier's office. And so it's, you know, I've been very clear through the 2014 election, a million questions in question period, I've made it very clear that we changed the rules when I became the Premier. But we were, and we worked with the Information Privacy Commissioner. Neither Laura Miller nor David Livingston worked for me. They did not have anything to do with me. And that period of time, I was not the Premier. So that is really the, important. I agree with that. But the other side of the argument is the Liberal party oh, fair enough, and, and but you, you've inherited the good that McGinty and uh, people might have done if there was any good and that was a bad one that yeah, you, you've and inherited. I, and and you, I, you may remember when I became the premier I did a lot of answering of questions about yeah. that and explanation mm -hmm. about uh, what had happened and what mm -hmm. we were going to do to uh, mm -hmm. to remedy the situation. Mm -hmm. I, I spent my whole first year mm -hmm. up to the 2014 election really answering questions about that. Then we ran an election on it in and 2014, yeah, I agree right? You. It, was, it, was, so, it was an issue in the last election and, and you still won. Ryerson is honored that you come every year and answer every single question and tolerate me. Thank you, thank Premier. You. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.